So, uh, Waiguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Waiguru Ji Ki Fateh. Um, as the last presenter of the conference, um, I'd like to, uh, I think, uh, speak on behalf of all the speakers, if I can, and just say thank you to all the organizers and all uh, the attendees that have made this um, event possible. And um, may it continue to be a place where privilege and marginalization comes together, and we continue to challenge hypocrisy. And. Uh, yeah, so thank you. And so, with reverence for the divine, I will begin. Okay, so how many people have seen this picture? Okay, this is a timeless sick woman. She can go as far back as my Pago or the modern day sick woman when you Google sick woman and look for images. So this is a very pretty woman. Um, I look at this picture and I wonder, um, one, uh, how does she have no hair? <laughs> like, this is some very good skin, maybe really good genetics. Um, but then I wonder, well, if this is a timeless woman, this woman has, you know, been here for time memorial of sick, uh, within the sick uh, span. Has this woman had to, um, do anything to create this image of herself. And I wonder if this woman has tweezed to get those eyebrows. Has she waxed? Did she bleach to get that really nice skin, thread? Or did she do the expensive but um, last a lot longer laser? Um, or creams because uh, they're really easily accessible. And I wonder if this was a choice for this woman. Um, I wonder if it's uh, pressures from media in general, and even if this was my pago, was it paintings or this idea of what is the beautiful woman back then um, that would have um, pressured her into making choices? I wonder if it's a role of men or just marriage in general. And I wonder most of all if she's bothered by the pain because whether you're tweezing, tweezing, waxing, bleaching, threading, lasering, or creams, it's all annoying, takes a lot of time, a lot of money, and it hurts. Um, and I wonder most of all why in uh, today's day and age um, with all the access to media uh, that we have and all the different forms of representation, why this image isn't more accessible why this image has never been seen out there, and why this representation isn't there. So that is uh, basically the crux of my paper, and um, the title of the paper is Hair Speaks, Sick Women Voicing Spiritual, Sexual, and Identity Body Politic. Um, the inquiry of the research was exploring women's experiences of, um, of embod embodying both the ideals of the sick identity and the ideals of the heteronormative or consumerized feminine identity at the same time. So um, hair. When I got curious about hair um, oh, over a decade ago, um, I began to have conversations and uh, the conversations and relationship um, and questions around hair changed after taking Amrit. And um, I, I began to notice that there was a very consistent and clear um, set of messages that women were able to identify um, as responses from the community um, in response to their struggles. So there was this um, idea out there, what's the big deal? It's such a girl issue. Um, there's bigger things to worry about. And often this would be the response that we would get from men. Um, or they just want to take the easy way out. Getting rid of it is easy. Keeping it is a test. Or why doesn't she just remove it? She looks like a man. How is she going to get married? So each of these messages uh, were reflected by um, the women I interviewed. I interviewed 10 women. And um, in one way or another, each of these messages are laden with judgment, assumption, and ignorance, and um, patriarchal hegemonic constructions. So um, 
What I also found, I very early on recognized that women were able to very clearly identify the expectations of others. So whether it was family, Sikh Sangat, non-Sikh Sangats, intimate relationships, media, social norms, or Gurdwara, women were able to very clearly identify the expectations of these different spaces. Um, and how these expectations kind of contributed to their navigation and negotiation of their feminine and Sikh identities. Um, but they weren't so easily able to identify their own voices. In fact, it was um, quite challenging at times for women to discuss what their own expectations of their body was and hair, and their expectations of themselves as in a Sikh uh, feminine identity context. So um, with that, um, it was with hopes to listen, understand, narrate, and um, politicize the voices that I heard that I began to research into the journeys of the 10 women. So the methodology was um, an ethnographic analysis of um, narratives of 10 diverse Sikh women. Um, the inclusion criteria was um, they were all either initiated or pre-contemplative initiated uh, to the Khalsa. Um, they were all committed to uncut case, uncut case on the head. Um, however, uh, whether they remove facial hair or what bodily hair they remove from their body was um, the variable. And five women were the star wearing, five women were not, and they were all ages 23 to 31. Um, and so often with research, and research that is most validated um, often comes from like very hard data. So why was it that I chose to uh, do narratives and maybe not um, a survey um, and provide data? And, that, and I think this uh, quote really speaks to it best, where um, categories and concepts we use for reflecting upon and evaluating ourselves come from a cultural context one that has historically demeaned and controlled women's activities, thus an exploration of the language and the meanings women use to articulate their own experience leads to an awareness of the conflicting social forces and institutions affecting women's consciousness. So um, it was through these uh, interviews that I was really able to find a voice for myself and um, and from after presenting, the experience has been that these voices have been able to resonate for a lot of women um, and voice um, struggles um, from different spaces and places. Um, the analysis was informed by works of Nikki Ginder Gore, Brian Axel, Judith Butler, um, men and women in this room who helped me along. And of course, um, through the inspiration of the Khalsa and the women, our four mothers, um, and uh, I guess mothers like the ones that Gurneet and Banna were reminding us of yesterday who were on the horses in 1947 and protecting the villages, which I had never heard about. So um, all of that, I think, allows um, for this voice in question to be possible. Okay, so if all these women were keeping the case on their head and they had a deep love and reverence for the case, um, why the struggle? Um, if they definitely had a journey which was either already committed to the Khalsa, Khalsa or a journey towards a commitment to the Khalsa, what was the issue? And um, so this uh, uh, woman um, stated, she speaks to that, uh, what the issue is. She states, now my hair is past my knees. My hair is very long. And to me, I like it. I don't mind my hair being long. I want to keep it healthy now. I like my eyebrows. There's something I'm kind of becoming more okay with. My leg hair is starting to bother me less. So where the contention is, is that how women relate uh, to their body or how their bodily hair and facial hair is related to isn't equal. Um, and so the situation is wrought with contention because it can't, hair can't be embraced equally on the body. So if there is a, a deeply religious, uh, you know, or a commitment um, to religiosity, I mean, c c keeping the case of the head becomes quite easy because it really fits closely with normative fem feminine identity. Um, however, when you get into facial hair or um, bodily hair, um, these sites interact with social and religious spaces differently. And so in both the spaces, women's sick identity and feminine identity can be challenged. So for facial hair, it's very visible, it's in the public sphere, and it is clearly counter-feminine. 
um, bodily hair um, is most usually hidden if it is there. Um, and so it comes uh, to speak in private spheres and is also clearly counter feminine and also void of sexuality. So this becomes um, a huge point of contention for women in their intimate relationships. So um, my research was into inquiring how women related to their bodies in these spheres and how their bodies were reflected back to them. Um, so different themes that emerged in the interviews were men, familial, severe, personal sangat, societal, hukam ret, panj pyare, loopholes, lack of discussion, frustration, lack of identity constructions to relate to, and then geographical location. But um, I don't have like five hours, so we're going to focus on um, the first five, and we will begin with men. So um, <clears throat> men were a reoccurring theme when um, speaking with the, uh, the women about their relationship with hair. And um, I'd like to make a note that every single one of the women I interviewed, um, as they would begin to answer uh, about their relationship with hair in relation to men, they wanted to note um, that they um, both honored and validated the struggle of sick men in keeping their dharis in turbans. And they really wanted to, like before they would begin to speak about themselves, they found it very important to put that forward and say that by, by them speaking about their struggle, they're in no way trying to um, minimize or take away from the struggle that men However, in the same sentence, they were able to say they don't believe that men would be able to um, understand or reciprocate that understanding for them. So um, women are not only aware of how patriarchal constructions of beauty um, ideals are expected of them, but they have actually also internalized them. So some prepare themselves, even if they're keeping their hair, they prepare themselves for the possible removal of hair because it may be expected after marriage. So this woman said, that's how I always thought of it. I'm not going to remove hair now, but eventually. I used to think that after I marry, I will because no guy is going to like it. Um, others expressed a sentiment along the lines, uh, they were like basically crossing their fingers, hoping that their bodies would be accepted, but it's an unknown, you, you don't know. Um, and then there's this Amritari woman who remarked that Amritari men are asking um, their Amritari wives uh, to remove hair before they marry them, um, specifically after they get engaged. So um, she states, it's unbelievable. I know so many women where their men tell them to remove it, hair. I mean, unbelievably, unbelievable amounts. I have lots of friends getting married, and many of them are like, my guy wants me to remove all my hair, pubic hair, all the hair before we get married. And that's his rule. And a lot of these girls have grown up amritari. It's part of these girls' identity. I get emotional. It's so unfortunate that a lot of these, those men keep hair themselves, but they have the expectations of a woman to remove it. Another course stated, a lot of Amritari women who do keep their facial hair say they can't find anyone to marry them. Women are having a hard time finding partners who value them with their hair. When it came to struggles in this uh, familial, familial sphere, um, this is where both like culture and religion mesh uh, very closely. And um, this quote uh, expresses that um, she was really aware of the expectations of, um, that her family had around bodily hair. She states, I stopped competitive swimming. I didn't feel comfortable with my leg hair. Sometimes I would have a little bit, I would shave a little bit without telling my parents, but it wasn't worth it. And it's interesting that this family later encourages this woman to get laser done um, for her facial hair um, to increase her prospects of marriage. Um, to, and um, hoping that it would also increase her self-esteem. But it actually becomes a painful experience for the woman because she's not sure if she wants to remove her hair. So in Sangat, um, when it came to Sangat, women uh, noted feeling of feelings of ostracization for having what was interpreted as weak sikhi or being a bad sikh versus a good one if they removed hair. 
And um, all the women were all active in, all these women were active in a Sikh leadership Sangat at one point or another. Um, they all noted that there was a lack of discussion around um, this issue. And that often the issue was relegated to like open Q&A in the corner or your personal time where women would get together and chat. Um, but there wasn't a real discussion about it. It was usually directives or some idea of this is the right thing to do and this is what you should do. And if you don't get it, it's a bit of a personal issue. And once again, you're weak. Um, and so it was never a Panthic issue. It continued to be a personal issue. Um, and actually, a lot of the women had never um, considered, um, had never, I guess, uh, really deconstructed or unpacked it until we were doing these interviews. And so it was, they were frustrating interviews uh, for them, but at the same time, liberating. Um, and so uh, this woman said, I wanted to be a part of the Sikh social network. But the way they talked about each other, if a, if a girl had her eyebrows done, it was, she probably did that to get so-and-so's attention. So the removal of hair um, was very quickly um, seen as sexually deviant and sexually motivated. So in um, societal, um, women talk about their experiences um, out side of our communities in general. And um, so this Amritari a woman with very prominent facial hair uh, stated, I used to take the bus all the time. I've seen people nudge their friends and say things. Things like, oh my god, look at that girl. She's got a beard. She's got a mustache. I try to be positive regardless of what they are saying. Another woman stated, the expectation for a woman is that she should be pretty, appealing to the eye. Pressure to be groomed and a part of being pretty as defined by society is a conventional pretty where you don't have facial hair. So simultaneously as women are navigating themselves within these different spheres of expectations, they're also having to navigate a very internal personal story in relationship with Sikhi. So this woman questioned here whether she was betraying a history that had brought her forth. She states, if I had a fine fuzz on my face, I'd just leave it, but I don't just have a fuzz, and that's why I continue with laser treatment. But it's made me cry. My thoughts go directly to six who got persecuted, and I'm enduring this pain for what? It was very conflicting how much pain they went through and how much they suffered for our rights and freedoms. And here I was, confused, and removing my hair. On one hand, I want to justify it's OK. On the other hand, I'm just waiting for it to finish. So as you can see, the struggle in all spheres is wrought with guilt, confusion, sadness, and isolation. So where does my body fit? And um, as I was doing the interviews, it became a real challenge to try to I, I was trying to attempt to draw like a diagram of in this space, this is what happens, in this space, this is what happens, but I'm, I just wrote it out and I'll walk us through it. Um, so I've, um, I'm creating a dichotomy of Amrit-oriented spaces and then non-Amrit-oriented spaces and non-Amrit-oriented spaces are not just Western six spaces, but they're all spaces, six spaces as well, that um, where Amrit is not um, the norm. So in Amrit spaces, the norm is to keep hair. Um, in the public of Amrit spaces, hair is to be kept on the whole body. It's still to be kept hidden. Um, and women are still to look groomed. In the private Am Amrit spaces, families suggest the removal of help hair sometimes to increase marriage prospects and to also possibly prepare for the removal of hair, uh, removal of hair for their partner. And what came through the narratives even is that Panj Pyare, um, and this came up a few times, had suggested the pre-removal of hair, so go get laser done and then come and take Amrit, or um, as one core shared a really uh, personal um, and emotional story that she accidentally removed hair and she didn't ever want to remove one piece of hair, but it happened, she was playing around with it, she said, and then she was so kind of just um, struggling with it that she went to her Panj Pyare and the Panj Pyare said to her, go get laser done and then come back and take Amrit again. 
so what became clear is um, who's going to tell um, you what, which punch bear I tell you what is not consistent either. Um, but it's not a Panthic issue. <laughs> And um, in non-Amrit oriented spaces, so all other spaces, hairlessness is modernity, it is femininity, it is beauty. And women with hair risk ostr ostracization, alienation, absolute rejection, um, and uh, non-acceptance, and a lot of isolation. And if hair is kept, and you're in a non-Amrit space, so all spaces out there, hair needs to be hidden. Um, so it's understandable uh, why uh, women over and over and over stated that they feel like they're stuck in a catch-22. Um, they felt they were doomed either ways, and Id identities were up for debate in um, either realms. So um, one woman stated that all these expectations of different spaces and the ex expectation of beauty was really imprisoning. Um, so where do we go from here? Is there a way out of this uh, cycle of appeasement um, and expectation which uh, cause guilt, shame, and um, isolation? Well, through the interviews, there was also a very, uh, a very strong voice that came through um, that um, inspired me and gave me voice to my journey as well. And that was that there were a few very clear voices um, that stated, um, and there were women who had engaged with all the struggles in the different spheres, and they stated that um, through these different struggles that they were able to find an autonomous and strong voice. And so both of the women who I'm going to quote, um, both wore the stars, so both of them were kestari, but one woman removed all her bodily hair and the other one kept all her bodily hair. The one who removed all her bodily hair um, was supported by a family that would have actually allowed to keep her all her hair. And the one who kept all her hair was actually surrounded by a family who often pressured her to remove it. So um, this is a woman with a dasar who removed all her bodily hair. She said, being one of the few women wearing a dasar, I would be approached by other women saying, you do your eyebrows, you shouldn't be a sick. She states, I'd rather do my eyebrows and still be a sick than take my turban off because I don't feel proud to step out of the house because of the way I look. And so the next woman is the one who wears a dasar and keeps all her bodily hair. And she says, I'm probably unique in that way because I don't know a lot of women that feel the same way, but I feel very sexy. I feel if I remove my hair, I would lose a lot of that appeal. So what I learned from these women is that both of them were um, embodying a, vo a strong voice of autonomy and that sexuality was very strongly and interpreted, uh, tied to and interpreted as self-confidence and self-esteem in their identities as sick women and feminine ones. They stated that they were not looking for loopholes or to convince women that one way is right versus another. Rather, were looking to feel confident and authentic in their choices and felt that they embodied at least the spirit of the Khalsa. This way, through a process of finding their voices versus succumbing to the socialized need to appease and meet others' expectations, they were able to um, embody that spirit. So how do we support women in building a sense of confidence and hearing their own voice so as to experience the reverence of their identities? So we mentioned over the last couple of days that often um, the sick identity is equated with the male identity. It's his turban and his the star. So all the women stated that they're looking for an alternative image out there of sick representation. Beautiful, hairful, sick woman. Where um, there would be pictures of sick women with you know facial hair, hairy legs, hairy arms, hairy armpits. So, um, so what am I saying then? Um, well, Nikki Gunindakor stated in the five Ks in a Karma of the Khalsa that Sikh representation and body politics have cited themselves in the body of the Sikh male. His hair, his turban, his five Ks and have honed the attention and speculation and research into identity, sexuality, and other anti-hegemonic discourses. 
So I attempt to expand on Nikki Singh's work by bringing attention to bodily hair of sick women, a space that has been rendered irre irre irrelevant to Sikh epistemology, spirituality, and identity politics. What I'm proposing has occurred is that by continuing to reiterate that no bodily hair is to be removed and leaving the discussion for sick women's bodily, for women's bodily hair unexplored, ignored, and marginalized as a personal issue of vanity, that we've rendered sick women's bodies silent and unpoliticized. Verinder Kalara states, states in Locating the Sick Bug, the turban forever renders six in some halfway house between tradition and modernity. There's no space for the turban wear in the plains of the West. I would like to reframe this perspective and argue that the haired bodies of sick women are too rendered in a halfway house between the sovereign sick feminine identity and the norms of the expected consumerized femininity, somewhere between the hidden and the rejected. There's no space for women's bodily hair in the plains of the West, in the communal spaces of six, nor in the private of our bedrooms. In fact, there's li little room left in our own mirrors. Bodily hair is discerned as necessary by most sick representatives, yet, offered, yet not offered space in sick discourses on any level, other than in the private complexities women negotiate themselves within. Sick women are being given a message. Do not ascribe to these already existing directives of hegemonic femininity and sexuality. However, if women are not to ascribe to the only norms of femininity and sexuality that we are exposed to, then an alternative needs to be available. An alternative that expectedly will not be embraced by the West, but will absolutely need to be embraced and written into our interpretations of sexuality and identity in sick spaces. Sick women's bodies are vying to be haired and hairless at the same time, to be strong sick women and feminine at the same time. So I propose that a great injustice is occurring as we render the social struggles of half hour calm predicaments that we as a collective cannot counter nor take responsibility for, for fear of what discourse may entail. From a CASA analysis, I cannot think of a more powerful tool to counter the violence of domination and hypocrisy than, and marginalization and then through asking, observing, and listening to the most marginalized, and thus challenging the status quo. Today, sick women are fighting a war waged against their gender before they're even born. Should they live, they live to experience systemic constructions on many socioeconomic political levels that continue to marginalize and silence their existence. So, I believe if six are the voice, that women's bodily hair is necessitated, it is just as important to make it a part of the political discourse of the Sikh identity, as it is half our month. And most important, we need to listen to women's voices. Just listen, not judge, hear their struggles. Um, because really right now, like it just takes me back to when Guru Nanak Sahib, um, you know, and this is really simplifying it, but said that there is no, nothing that you need between you and the divine. It's a direct relationship between you and the divine. So really that's between you and hearing your voice, right? Mantu Jot Sarupa, Apna Mupashan, right? So for us to recognize our value, we have to start, women have to know that they can um, have access to who they are and take the spectators out of the room. So, but right now, we have expectations of our family, men, media, all these expectations. So we're not even able to relate to ourselves to figure out what do we think for ourselves. So we need to listen and listen without judgment. And that is it. <laughs>